September 22nd, 2022. I call the meeting to order. Tim. Tim Beard here. Bill. Bill Wilkinson here. Bert. Bert Spalding is here. Steve. Steve Morris here. Jenna Darman here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Transportation would be removed from D and moved to October 13th, and that would be replaced with budget timeline. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Any other adjustments from the board? Okay. Seeing none, um, I will make the motion to approve those adjustments. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, I need a roll call vote. So, Tim? Yeah. Bill? Bill Bert? Steve? Steve Morris, aye. Jenna Darling, aye. Okay. So those are all passed. That brings us to public comment. Ms. Ferrigno, you are first. Lisa Ferrigno, I'd like to start by offering my congratulations to Hanover High School and Enfield Village School, both schools in our regions that have been named Blue Ribbon Schools. Hearing the news this week, I'm happy for those school districts. But it also made me sad for the students of Newport. We were a blue ribbon school, and I believe we can be again. When we were a blue ribbon school, we had the resources the students needed to be successful. In 2008, Richards had five grades, kindergarten through fourth. There was a full-time reading teacher for kindergarten, two full-time reading teachers for first grade, and a reading teacher assigned to each of the other three grades. That is six reading teachers for five grades. Now Richards includes seven grades, and there is only one full-time reading teacher and two part-time teachers. Seven grades, one full-time, two part-time reading teachers. Other resources we had at Rib Richards School when we were a blue ribbon school included an instructional para for first grade to help support students and an intervention teacher. All of those positions have been cut. That is eight less staff members available to our students while adding three grade levels to the school. That is the equivalent of trying to run a car on a quarter tank of gas and expecting it to go farther. As we look ahead to the budget season, we must consider how to best serve our students. We are seeing more needs than ever before. Students need extra support. Instead, we have less support. We also need to remember this when we go to the polls in less than two months. Take the time to talk to the local, state, and national candidates. Ask them what they are doing to support public schools. Ask them how they are guaranteeing adequate funding for our students. Thank you. Behind the curtain. Um, I just wanted to make an announcement for the public as much as anything else that NCTV has moved. We've just reestablished re our um, uh, IP addresses and they've changed. So anybody who is um, logging in, you can't use your bookmark. You have to read bookmark uh, NCTV. You have to go to the site. It's still nctv-nh.org, but you have to go to that site and, um, and re-bookmark it if you're going to use a bookmark. Otherwise, it won't go to, it won't go to it. 
But as far as the TV is concerned, and as far as our online channel is concerned, and, and everything else is all the same. It's just, it's just a, a different <laughs> internet location to get to the site because we've changed providers. Okay? Thank you. You got it. Thanks a lot. Second. Any discussion? Um, discussion. Under on, on page two. Uh, committee assignment. Uh, to put Tim there alone. Stained. You might need to go to the mic for John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> chase you down. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions, but just to give you a little overview, we have an eligibility requirement for all student athletes. Uh, it is an academic eligibility requirement. So under that, uh, they can fail up to one class and be eligible to, partic to participate in athletics. Uh, we do have a stricter standard than the minimum required by the New Hampshire um, NHIAA that regulates all of our interscholastic sports. Um, we also offer our students a probationary period if they come to us and they want to play sports but they've not met the minimum requirement to play. And I can tell you that on a regular basis, say, you know, Donna and I just spoke about you know, why. Why don't we have a higher standard? Why would a student be permitted to fail potentially during one marking period. I want to be clear, it's one marking period. Um, and you can go back and forth on this topic. I, you know, in one sense, yes, uh, student athletes represent our school themselves, their teams, our community, and they are held in, in that regard to a higher standard. On the other hand, we know we have kids who are already at risk, who are looking for a connection to our school that's positive. 
and maybe sports is that one thing that's keeping them engaged and working hard towards their goals of earning a high school diploma. Um, for me, I, I'm here to watch kids grow. I think that you know, making sure that students know you're expected to be here as a student first, absolutely. Um, athlete and extracurriculars are, are second, but I also recognize the importance of those secondary things. And I'll even speak as a coach for a minute because I get to wear that dual hat these days. Um, I can say that it's a, it's a really healthy opportunity to wrap around a student um, in a way that you wouldn't have if you didn't have them on a team. So happy to answer any questions you might have about that. I just personally think that a standard is a standard. And I understand, like you said, you can wrap your arms around and everything else, but at some point in time, and maybe it's not this year, because I mean, even society above, outside of this realm, doesn't hold people to account in the same sense anymore. Um, I just think that uh, the most important thing that a student gets is the education. I can see your point that the only thing some students may have is football or cheer or you know, uh, extracurricular activity that they're participating in. That gives them the one reason to come to school. Uh, it just, eventually, I think society probably needs to get back to holding people to a standard of this is a reward. You don't get to just play sports because you're here or an extracurricular activity. You have to meet the standard and then you can participate. Because it's like that in college. You gotta maintain if you get a scholarship or if you wanna keep going there, you gotta pass. Yeah, so it's just one of those things. I, I had brought it up not so much to, other than the, just to have the discussion to find out why the standard is not no pass, no play. I, I also wanna add too that it's, it's per quarter, right? So if a student is failing in a quarter, then they have um, to show that they're able to pass all of their classes by at least a 70%, and they're bi-weekly checks. And if they go below that, then they're asked to turn in the uniform. So they, they're, they're, they're looked at a lot more, yeah, right? Yeah, thank you for clarifying it. it it's, if anything, they have to work harder um, still. I, the only thing that I would say is I, I'm not a fan of everybody gets a trophy. I think people work hard and you earn what you put time into. But I also recognize that in high school, it's the last stop before adulthood. And if you're going to learn something, I prefer they learn it now. Um, given that, there's a variety of reasons students find themselves in a position where they have a failing grade at a quarter. I, I like that in high school, you have some latitude there to still be not an adult um, with still having the expectation that you need to rise. And I would, I did share with Donna that any student who has not met eligibility requirements and who has gone on academic probation for us, which has a higher bar, we now have to pass all of them with a standard of a 70 um, in every class you're enrolled in. I haven't had a kid not meet it. So it, it's actually a, a wonderful carrot in that sense too. But I think... Um, yeah, and I, and I think it's very important we have discussions like this. So I, I welcome, you know, bringing it up, honestly, because it has to be what we envision for our students and what we want for them. One of the second pieces that I, that I really like, too, was that a student can petition to be put on probation. It's not always guaranteed. So if it's a student that she's finding that's habitually doing this, she has said no to students that said, no, you're not on probation, turn your stuff in, and you're done. Yeah, I'm that principal. No, it's good. <laughs> it's, and it should be like that, too, for if they have a behavior problem and they get in trouble. Then yes, yeah. That standard yeah. should be held because the students, more than the parents or us even know, that that stu other student might have gotten in trouble, but then they're still suiting up because they're the all-star on the team. Like, I got, not to yeah. say that that happens yeah. or has happened, but those are the kinds of things that I think a lot gives us the freedom to teach them now while they're younger instead of oh well you're our best player so we'll let it slide well then that's going to teach them a lesson for life 
in the opposite direction. You can ask uh, if students that I have you know, earned a suspension. Which happens from time to time, and when it coincides with game day, and they're like, oh, you, you know, can you move that suspension? They know the answer. I didn't pick the time when I broke the rules. So I'm sorry that it happened on this day and that it's game day. And I hope you apologize to your teammates because you landed yourself in that position. So I, I'm, I'm hoping we're moving away from, from those days, but I'm aware of that uh, thought in the past because um, I agree with you. You need to be held accountable, but I also want to give you a chance to grow. Right. So. It's integrity. Bert. For some, without it, there wouldn't be here. It's a hook. And if they learn 69%, then uh, that's better than 20, 30, 40 drugs, beer, alcohol, or anything else. So, uh, if sports keeps them here, uh, we've done the right thing. It's not disagree with you. We need to hold society to the task, but we also need to understand there are circumstances that some children can't overcome. And we get them here. We've done something. Bill? So I just wanted to add, um, you know, for many years I was a custodian at Toll when Toll was open. Um, for eight years I saw a lot of kids come through, and I had the opportunity to get to know them, uh, oftentimes on a one-to-one -one basis. And I can support um, the idea that, that sports really brought a lot of at-risk kids. Um, I remember when uh, my daughter started cheering varsity, you know, you started going to the games all the time, and you know, I would see one particular student, and I'm like, wow, he was always in trouble at all. You know, so it gave him something. Um, I do agree, though, that there does have to be some accountability, and whatever that process is, it's established, and we don't change it, period. Um, but, yeah, I would agree with everybody else. that I have seen, you know, sports really um, kind of integrate a student into more... Uh, mainstream way of, of interacting uh, with the school. So, yeah. The only thing that I would add to is that I recognize there are things that the public doesn't know, and that's by design. So we have students who are on alternative plans, who, who work through their academics in an alternative way, and may not be as public for everybody, um, and know that they're still held to the same expectations, but obviously we change it to meet what they are doing. So they have to still meet the requirements of their plan. You know, but I, I also know that an outsider looking in, you might be like, how the heck is that happening? Um, I'm happy to, if Donna ever comes and asks me, how is this student doing this thing? I can answer that, that's my job. Um, but I do know that from a public eye, kind of outside looking in, it can be confusing sometimes. Um, but certainly, if anyone ever had a question, I'm happy to answer it. because she is one of the only principals in the state of New Hampshire that actually coaches a sport. So we're very excited High about school. that. High school. High school. Yes. Rob, Rob's been coaching basketball for last time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but one of the high school Thank principals. You. So that's really good for her own school. So yes. that's good. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. Thank you. So, so on to student rep. We're very lucky to have an amazing student body representative that will be joining our school board. He will begin with us on October 13th at that meeting. Um, Shannon is here tonight again to talk, to tell us a little bit about our new member that will be joining us on October 13th. So I'm pleased to tell you that Stephen Emery is a senior in our school. He's a talented musician, talented student. I see Ed nodding because we know Stephen. Um, he's very excited to explore this opportunity with you and get to know more about it. Uh, I do want to share that just given the time of year, it was, I asked for student interest. Uh, tomorrow's technically the last day. Maybe I'll get one more. Cross your fingers. Uh, and hopefully we can build this into our student election process moving forward. 
but I think that Stephen will do an exceptional job for you. I think he's a well-rounded young man. He's a very honest young man. He's got a good sense of humor. And like I said, he's one heck of a musician. So. We wanted at least two, just to have an alternate in case Stephen couldn't be here one evening. So maybe that's something we could just work out going down the road, um, just so that we stay in compliance with that policy. I think we said up to two. Oh, it's up to two? Yes. Okay. Well, I guess I firmly had two in my head. I think right. two would be great. Two would be lovely. We're going to build. Right? All right. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Shannon. I think people are just, con they don't know what it is yet, so yep. they want to just kind of see what it is yep. before they jump on it. Okay, report out on grants. What uh, were no, we going to talk about? Oh. The committee was also a chance for us, or was that not a, nope, that was on report out, so I don't know. This, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I missed it, I missed, um, so committee. I did, I did skip committee, right? No, one handbooks. We do. Um, so oh, handbooks. Yeah. Oh, I apologize. Oh, no, handbooks, middle school handbook. So on Friday, I sent everyone a copy of the middle school's, I think it was Thursday actually, mm -hmm. student handbook. Um, I also included the one-page summary of the changes. Tonight, I am asking for your approval to move forward with the handbook and the proposed changes. I have David Bailey here with me this evening, who is our new building principal at the middle school, and as well as I have Jessica Packard, who is the dean of students, here to answer any questions that you may have regarding the handbook. Are you first, Bert? If you two, you guys can. Yeah. <coughs> Welcome. Any questions from the board on the handbook? Uh, <laughs> so I guess my question kind of goes back to high school as well. Like I said, I missed that one too, but I just when I was looking through this one the other day. So on the we ask that parents of Newport students agree to support your child's learning. And it's not necessarily that we need to add it in here or anything, but we had talked about stressing the importance of doing their best on the test. Um, I, I don't know, but, you know, that could get glossed over or whatever, but, um, you know, we're encouraging them, but we, we've all heard stories from either seeing it from teachers' perspectives or my daughter telling me that her friends just click through the button I, I don't know if it's worth putting in there, but, you know, but to make sure that the parents discuss the importance of how that affects all kinds of things other than just how quickly they get out of the classroom. I, I, yeah, and I don't even know how you could word it in there, but that was one of the things that I saw when I looked at the other ones, is, especially the high school, was there's nothing in there about encouraging students to do well in their testing, because we do take testing, so that's... Mm -hmm my main concern in the sense of communicating to the parents because it's on the first page or two of the handbooks. Bert? Um, I'm allowed to uh, abstain if you take this to a vote. Um, I've spent my time reading the wrong one. Okay. Bill or Tim, do you have anything? No? I thought it was really cohesive. I think it blended in really nicely with elementary and high school and it flowed really nicely so I I really don't have anything to add but thank you for well, all your hard work. Jessica did a, a lot of the work on it you know as, yeah. as you know I came in relatively late to the process so you know a lot of the, the kudos should go to her. Thank so. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right so is there a motion to uh, accept the middle school handbook? Is there a second? Uh, all, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Aye. All right, thank you very much. Thank you both for thank coming. All righty. Now's your committee. Now's my committee. <laughs> Back on track. Okay, so committee, Bert, you brought up that just Tim was listed in the minutes that you would like to be part of that committee for finance? Um, yes. Uh, if 
No, which one was that? Was that the future one for like? That's where you meet twice. Big projects. Diane before the meeting. Before the meeting for like oh. half an hour. Yeah. So you kind of stay abreast so that there's like. Okay, so we're talking now about the all the, the two board person. Yes. Meeting. Okay. Yes. Which the finance committee? Um, I would like to express my objection. Uh, there can be questions that can be asked in that building and answered, and three other board members don't know that the question happened or the answer. If we discuss our finances, which are the underlying purpose that we as a board are here, along with the other oversight responsibilities, is dollars. So therefore, a question asked by me and answered for me should be devoured by the entire board. Same way for you, Tim, Bill, all. So, so going in, uh, I did not participate, have not participated in that, and uh, I will not, because I strongly believe that we need to do it as a function of the board. So what's brought to us is explained to us. We uh, ask questions and, uh, and go from there. That's my feelings. Okay. I would say that I know that this rotation was, first of all, I think having everybody know all of the questions that are asked makes a lot of sense. The way this rotation was set up was so that we didn't just have the same two people going all of the time so that everybody would, would have the information was the thought process behind it. Um, I'm certainly open to a discussion about it, but I just wanted to let you know that that's how at least in the last two years that it, it, it was chosen to be done. But we have the, the purview to change it if we want to. So, oh. Bert? I, I can understand that, but I also understand that um, what becomes a very high responsibility for the board is that we know the finances and all of us know the finances. That we're not, no one's running in the dark. Uh, and you might argue that, well, that wouldn't happen if the board members came in and did the sit down. Uh, it wouldn't happen maybe for the ones that came in and did the sit down, but it might happen to somebody else that wasn't there that, that had, didn't have access to that question or answer. We are a board uh, separating us on the finances um, in different forms to me is unacceptable. Any other thoughts? My thought on it is, so I'm on the CTE committee. And so I've been to, I don't know, seven or eight meetings in the last few months over it. I've spoken briefly about it, but later on in our agenda is committee report outs, which would allow any of us on a committee to be able to say, hey, this is what we met on and invite our committee, the com anybody from the committee, if they want to brief it. So we have the experts here that are doing it day to day. Um, so then you could provide the brief out. So if I'm saying something going on in the CTE world and I brief it here, it would be the same as if you or Mr. Beard had heard something from Diane and then came in here to brief us on a committee report out and we hadn't heard it or whatever, then that gives Diane an opportunity to answer it. It's almost kind of the same thing. I, I see where you're coming from. If it's a, if it's a holy cow, we're in this bad situation and we don't have committee report outs, then yeah, that, that's not fair because then only you or Mr. Beard will know what's going on on that given day. But if we have, regular committee report out scheduled to where even if it's a two minute brief from each of us from our that are the primaries on a committee or if it needs to be longer obviously but uh, so I, I could see it being addressed in that manner in the report out um, so I, I can go either way with it I see your point which is if Diane tells you something yesterday before today's meeting when do we really have a chance to brief it because if it's bad, y'all might address it or give her advice from the two of y'all, but it's not the same as getting advice from the board. Or do you just receive the information and say, that's bad, we need to talk about this at the board this week? 
And a committee doesn't negate any single responsibility of being, it doesn't negate Diane's responsibility to report it to the board as a whole at a meeting. It was really the purpose of the finance committee was just so that all of the members continually had access to the BA and could ask our questions and report it out with the expectation that when Ed was here, that Ed was still give the entire board report outs as well. But Bill, you wanted to say something. Um, much <coughs> not again, I, I agree that necessarily these um, smaller meetings don't negate what happens in the board. Um, I see the potential that if Mr. Beard or whoever happens to be meeting with Diane at the time comes up with a question, that kind of um, might lay the groundwork for how you present to the board at the meeting. You know, like, oh, okay, that's a question that needs to be addressed. Um, yeah, so I, I agree. Actually, I agree with both Bert and, and Steve um, that, yeah, without regular, you know, report outs, yeah, that could be a forum, but with a regular rotation and regular report outs, um, I see it as having the potential to just improve the discussion, not only in those committee meetings, but here in this room at the board meetings. I'm not saying we don't do it. I'm saying I'm not going to do it. Okay. That's the difference. Tim, did you have anything any thoughts? I'm so confused about what the finance committee is about. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I think Cheers. I think before our last um, administration at the SAU, Bert can correct me if I'm wrong, but I I don't know that anybody met with our business administrator. I don't know. It was before my time too. So. The thought was, is that if we had this kind of ad hoc finance committee that allowed every member to rotate through so that at the time Ed could brief them, once we had a steady BA, could brief them on the state of the district's finances. They could ask any questions, learn, become more familiar with our budget, and then Ed would still present to the entire board. But we would just rotate through. Complexity of it and the necessity of its review. Um, I'm looking as a board <coughs> member to understand it more thoroughly than I've ever understood. When we do 1100, I want to know what a teacher does, what the class size is, what the total costs are, and then I want to move to the next one. That's 150. But I need to know that because I, I need to say and find significant funds that can go down to our problem, which is the elementary school, and solve it. What we heard tonight from Lisa was how it was. Well, now I want to look when it was that way, where were we? So if we were here and we're down here now, I want to... I want to be able to figure that out. So then I can stand and argue in front of this board that in fact, this $40,000 that that's here needs to be here. And maybe the board will agree and maybe they'll disagree. But I need to review this like reviewing a blood stain under a microscope. I want to know it inside and out. So that means that someone's got to come here and explain it to this board, at least for me, in detail. And we all have the detail. And it's not a five minute deal. It's not handing out 12 pages printed on both sides with line items on it that add up to $20 million. So I, I see it being done differently. The BAC gets it as a package. And if I'm going to the BAC, I need to tell them that it's tomatoes in that box and what are they? So I, uh, I want it to happen here in front of the public and we might be surprised what we learn. And I, I know that probably makes, makes some person a little bit uncomfortable. Well, 
So for me, I'm still learning as I'm going, so I'm, I'm figuring things out. But when I build the next budget, I plan on putting notes in the, in the line items of what makes up that line because the, there's just too much information for me to digest. So that's the way I feel I'm going to learn what belongs in, a, in the line item, and you're going to be able to see those notes so you know exactly what built that line. Um, so that's going to be different. But in, but in 1100, am I going to have those notes for every line? You should. <coughs> I, I don't know if it will be to the detail that you're expecting, because I don't know if the computer can handle that much detail as far as there's only so many characters I can put in the notes. <laughs> um, I see it's not, I don't see it as a one meeting in depth. Right, right. I get it. I get it. Um, but I'd have to get the information from this. I mean, the school's going to say to me, I need 10 teachers. I'm just going to build in what, what their needs are. I don't get down to how many students per teacher and all that. I mean, that's not the level that I get into. So you probably have to have that administration here to explain that as well. Maybe I used a, a bad example. What I want to do is I want to get to the minutia. I, I want to know what makes this pyramid right. money so that we can say, aha, as a board, we can review it. Maybe something we don't know. Mm -hmm. We have got one board member who's been here for a, quite a while and the rest who haven't. Mm -hmm. So are we going to jump into this pool and, 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 uh, and just say, oh, it's okay? Because, yeah. No, uh, I get that. But I... I plan on giving you details in, in those line items so you can see what made up that line because I need to know what makes up that line. So you mean to say the four of us can learn together? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. I can understand. Tim, Steve, Donna is what I saw. feel like, are you guys going to ask me questions like, so Tim, you're on finance, tell me about this, because I'm going to be like, I have no clue you're talking about, this is what she does for a living, so, where if it was like, hey, we're doing a finance committee for lights on the football field, well, that's a whole different thing, all right, there's one project, not the whole school budget of $20 million. I, when, so when I first got on the board, you probably get the same thing, it was told to me it was more of a, to help us learn the lingo and the, so going back to what you were saying as a rotational thing where somebody like Mr. Spalding understands the budget more than all of us combined because he's been going to these meetings for however five, seven years maybe. Oh, but, <laughs> but so there's there's probably value in it to like the three of us going and sitting down with Diane and having some questions and more of a learning ex because that's how it was briefed to me at first. Was and that that's it was how more I understand of an opportunity it so that you're not caught off guard when Ed briefs, but you've had some, you're getting accustomed because it's a lot of stuff that we've never, like when you're saying 1100, you're smiling, Diane's smiling. I don't know what 1100 means. I'm <laughs> so all the teachers, um, uh, just, a quick, just a quick comment. Uh, it is a bit uh, ironic that the man who uh, has been doing this for decades is sitting here and wants more review. <laughs> That's like the bus driver, you know, uh, <laughs> he damn well better know which way his tires are supposed to roll. So I'll say before I get to Diane, no, it sounds like if, if, if you need to meet with Diane, let's just have it there as a placeholder. If you need, if you have questions of what is 1100, what is this finance project, then I like to have that opportunity for you to do that. But if it's not necessary, then I, I don't want to waste my time either, Diane. I, it, <clears throat> I could be mistaken, but I think that we're talking about two totally different committees right now. We're talking about a budget committee, and we're talking about a finance committee. A finance committee is basically a monthly type of thing. So a, a finance committee is, is Diane prepares how much money is that we've, we've spent in the budget, what do we have left for teacher, um, for um, 
open positions and goes over that. So that is something that she can do monthly. And before that, a couple board members could sit with her and if they have questions. A lot of times um, questions come when it gets sent to you and then you call and you say, hey, what about these questions? What about this? What about this? A budget, a budget meeting is when we sit down with the budget and we go line item by line item and we say, here's the 1100s, this is how many teachers, this is what, what schools they're in, this is what their pay, are, pay is. And so that's, those are two different things. A budget meeting for most parts, um, at least that I've been part of, has been like a whole Saturday where you just, the, the, the team comes with a budget and we go over the budget with the school board so that way the school board can look at it and say, okay, well, what does this mean? Okay, that's what that means. What do you have under this? Okay, this is where we, we buy pencils and pens and that's what that means by supplies. And, and so that's what it is. One of the things that we're also working on is breaking up the budget because right now when a building principal looks at their budget, they have almost everybody's budget in it. They have Carrie's budget in it. Budget in it. They have some um, buildings and grounds. They have tech stuff. They have curriculum stuff in it. So that's not all their budget. And so we're looking at pulling those pieces and bringing them to where they belong. And so the budget for the schools will look a little bit smaller because it'll only be the things that the building principals control. And then we'll have everybody re be able to report out on them. So you may have more things that you're looking at, more pages um, in a sense, right? But what's going to be is you're gonna have people to explain them. So you'll have um, Bryn Kane that will be able to go over what consist of curriculum and what is in the curriculum lines and how is, is professional development. She'll go over that. Carrie will go over the special ed stuff, you know, out of district placements, one, you know, paraprofessionals, those types of things. So you'll have more specifics at a budget meeting than you would as, as a, fi on a finance committee. A committee is more or less just what's going on, you know, what can we support you with? You, you see the need for anything else, you know. So that way, you know, you're not sitting here at a meeting and Diane all of a sudden says, oh, we're like going way over budget by $250,000 and you guys aren't aware of it. And you're right. gonna fire me right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so this way, so I, I'm, I'm wondering if that's what we're looking at is two totally different meetings. So finance committee is basically how I spent the money or how the money gets spent and the budget committee is building the next budget. Yes. For, for the finance is looking at what's now yeah. and what the others looking the forward. Okay. Yes, the and we've district, already talked about the, district, the book too. It's going to be. Going this down. district has been through some real trauma, where we've got uh, 12 special ed kids here all of a sudden, and we need this much money. Well, they didn't get the money, and things happened. So, I, as a board member, have to know that everything we're spending has a body behind it, and a reason behind it, as opposed to a way to get money in order to do things that we might not give them permission to do. Uh, and to uh, three days before deliberative session come out and say you need $300,000 more is unacceptable. So um, I, need, I need that minutia. I need, I need the, the knowledge behind it. And, uh, and I don't think I will get that by going in for an afternoon meeting I'd probably go in at seven o'clock and wait on the stairs until uh, somebody came in and we'd leave at the end of the day. Uh, so I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying that, that my review will be, will be different. Bill. Um, just to build on uh, what Bert said on <coughs> earlier, Bert mentioned, you know, before I can stand in front of the board and try to, you know, promote this or promote that, um, I think we all have to recognize that it's really not just a board that we have to kind of sell this budget to. It's, it's the public. Um, that's really going to be the big push, and I agree with Bert. I'm going to do the exact same thing line by line throughout the budget. You know, whether that happens in an all-day, you know, marathon session on a Saturday or, you know, it's done kind of you know, in pieces or however it's done. Um, that was one of the things that I ran on was that I want to know how every dollar we spend is benefiting the students. So one of the things that, that I'm looking at doing as we move forward is 
because you know I've always said full transparency and so the budget book is going to be a lot different this year the budget book is going to be broken into sections so when I say um, we're looking at a school right and if you look at the budget book now it, it kind of just talks about this is what we've done this year right so what the budget book is going to look like it's going to look like here's what here's my budget here's additionally what I like and here are the reasons why. So you will get an outlook of what the budget looks like. And you'll have an explanation in the budget book that says why these, why we're, we see an increase in maybe teacher salary because maybe we had to add an additional teacher due to class size. So you're going to, there's, it's go, there's going to be verbiage to, to go along with why our budget is either going down, right? We may see a drop in, in teacher and this could be because the class size went down, you know, but whatever it may be, you're going to have that explanation as well the public. So it's going to be a, a probably, I want to say it's probably going to be about 50 pages, so they're probably going to be like, wow, are you kidding me? But it's going to be um, very in-depth on what each budget consists of, and it's going to be broken down with, you know, Carrie going over what her budget is and what she, you know, the expectations, why she needs this money and you know, how much more or less or, or whatever it is. The same thing with Bryn, except in our curriculum, we're going to now add in what our test scores are and, you know, those types of things. So people will be able to look at the book and see where our SAT scores are, are falling at, where our, you know, our state testing is falling at, all those things. It's going to be right in the budget book. Okay. Well, that budget book, are you ready before the BAC meets? Before the one. The meets. Budget Advisory Committee. Um, when are they meeting? Usually in December. Oh, yeah, we have a calendar coming up. Well, we're going to, we have a calendar that's coming up, and so it'll show you um, exactly um, when everybody, but we're going to start working on it. So it should, it, it should be. I'm sure it will be. So what will be the first uh, public presentation of the suggested budget? It's, we have it, I added into the agenda the timeline. So you'll have, so the, we have the timeline coming up on when we're going to have all that stuff. Okay. All right, so as for the finance committee, I hear, I'm hearing that some find value, others don't. That's fine. I'll make up a rotation. And certainly if you have questions, you can reach out to Diane and just, I would have the expectation that, um, you know, Steve and I talked about having committee reports being a standing item on our agenda that if you think there's a question that the rest of the board member would, board members would benefit from hearing, that we hear that as well. That's all. Okay. All right. Um, anything else for committees? No. Is there anyone, anything that is on here that people need to either sign up for or was incorrect? Or? No, I don't think so. I look through it unless anybody else sees anything that's incorrect. Okay, <clears throat> moving on. Now it's report out on grants. Yes, now it's report out on grants. So you should have in your packet that looks like this, and as well as Carrie is going to put it up on the board, that kind of goes over, gives a, a brief update on um, the grants to date. And so I just want to talk a little bit about each, what each grant entitles. So the, and I, I, don't, I know this, this is also online, so everybody has access to this as well. So it's not just something that's going to be shared tonight. So this is on our website? This is on our website, yes. Okay. It's with our board packet stuff, so it is oh, right. on there. Okay. So when we talk about Title I, Title I is not for all of our buildings. Title I is for our elementary school and our middle school. So when we receive Title I services, it can, the money can only be used in those buildings. So if we had an event that we needed, like for instance, for Title I, summer, summer school can be used out of Title I. We could not use that money in our high school because our high school is not a Title I school. We can use it in our middle school and our elementary school. So the purpose is to provide children with, to receive a fair, equitable, and high quality education. So and it also works to help close the achievement gaps. This right here, the big thing about Title I is a lot of our money comes from the free and reduced forms that parents fill out. So that's why it's huge that they fill these forms out because that's how they base a lot of our money on is through that. Um, and we're very, we've had a lot of parents fill out the forms, so that's great. Um, we have about 52% of the people that have filled it out currently qualify for free and reduced. Over half of them were automatically qualified. 
so they didn't have to go through a whole process. Um, and that could be because they're already receiving state assistance, they could be homeless, those types of things would automatically qualify for somebody for that. So what I've given you is if you look at the 2122, it gives you the allocations, which is the $783,547.24. Then I gave you a, a brief overview of what that money was spent on. So we took the Title I money and we spent it on 12 staff members' salary. And this, is, this is includes the reading and math specialist, our family liaison, Title I teachers, and before and after school staff. Now, the, um, and once again, this is just for elementary and middle school. This is nothing to do with high school. We also used it for our summer program that we recently had this summer. Learning tools and materials, so we have a music program, Exact Path, which is um, an uh, online program that our students use. We are currently going through letters training, so we have 33 of our staff members that are going through letters training, which is the science of reading, so they're learning more, more in depth about reading and, and how to better provide services for our students. And then um, reading space furniture. Yes? So, on the same topic here, it had been brought up before that we need Title I teachers, and I had asked a previous administration, and I was told that it was because we can't hire them because we're getting our money too late. Uh, have you all experienced that? So we can hire Title I teachers on time as long as we're lot, allocated the money? Yes, yeah, so a lot of times what happens, right, is that you, you get your allocation, right, but it, all Title I staff members, so. I'll give you an example. At the end of the year, when we have to do our, hire our Title I staff to come back for the following year, what we have to say to them is that it's pending funding, right? And so um, any of our grant-funded programs, uh, staff members, that's what it says on their contract. It's always pending grant funding. So you can hire someone. Um, for some people, they think it's a gamble, right? A lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to be hired if I'm under a grant because you never know year to year if you're going to get it. Um, for Title I, it's fairly common that you almost get the same amount of money every time, and then a lot of times you have rollover. So if you look at the 21-22 the school year, we're rolling all over $91,000. That means we didn't spend that money for this past year. It's being rolled crazy, over though, right? to this school like, year. We were told that we don't get our money in time, and that's why we're short Title I. I'm not making that up. I'm not accusing. I'm just, I'm, oh, thank so, you. Like, you like it's your fault because you've only been here for a few <laughs> but so if there's ninety one thousand dollars left over that seems like it's almost enough money to hire two title one teachers which would have been two less on the list of eight teachers that aren't at that school i don't think that would cover a full-time teacher and benefits salary hmm. and benefits or even one no uh, not quite Well, we get what we get. So we don't, they, we can't say to them, we'd like this much money. They look at, they take an overall of what, how many um, applications we have, our population, and then they generate the amount of money that we're going to get. So we get that. And then we have to spend it. It's a yearly, it's done yearly. Title I is the only grant that is yearly. Our other grants last two years. Title I is, it rolls over every year. So at, so this time of year, um, by September, it's by the end of, well, September 1st, we have to have all of our Title I money spent because it rolls over to the next year. So um, we, already, we'll not, we already know how much money is rolling over and how much money we're getting. So do I already have Title I money for this year, yes, because you'll see that on the very next page. I already know what our Title I is for this year. So it, it usually happens in the summer. That the money changes could change year to year, so there's some you know, flexibility that's required for teachers or anything else. But at the end of the day, if our families are filling out their form, so that is a large portion of it, and we are allocated more or the same amount, then we should be able to hire at least what we have, not that we're in an off-cycle hiring stream because of anything else. That's, we need the families to fill out the forms. That will generate Title I money, which will mm -hmm. then generate 
more teachers on these specialties at the middle and elementary school? Right. One of the things, I mean, they, what they'll say to you, right, is they don't necessarily recommend putting teachers in a grant. And the reason is, is because after a while, people expect that, and if the grant runs low and you can't hire that, then the expectation would be you put it in the budget. And so people are always afraid, okay, now you're going to ask me to put that much money in a budget, right? And so people get leery of that. But we're looking at how Title I money was spent and how it wasn't. Because I, what I can tell you is, as you, you'll see as we move closer to, we had to go almost on a spending frenzy because we had two or three titles that ended, and if we didn't spend the money by, the, by September 1, we lost it. Spending frenzy makes me nervous. Makes me nervous, too. So for instance, when I, well, I'll, I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. So Title II is for professional development, right? And so at the end of last year, at the end of the school year, teachers leave. So there's all this money left for professional development. The grant expires the beginning of September. You have to have all the money allocated by the 30th of, June, of um, September. You don't have staff in your building for the most part during the summer. So, so that's what we ran into. So we had all this Title II money to spend, but we didn't have the staff in the building. Now, if we were here, at the end of last year, we could have reached out to staff and say, oh, we're going to be offering responsive classroom this summer. Anybody interested in come to go in a responsive classroom, we'll pay you to go. We have this going on this summer. You know, there were a, a few that did take advantage of it, um, but not as many as we would have liked to. There's also the opportunity where we um, were looking at aligning our curriculum, right? So what we could say to staff is, all right, if you, if any staff members are willing to come in and work on aligning curriculum. Like for instance, uh, physical education, if we align it so it goes straight up, you know, el uh, middle school, I mean, elementary, middle, high, we could have the, the PE teachers, PE and health teachers all come in during the summer because you can't really do it during the work day. It gets very difficult and the changes of hours is different. Then we can have them come in um, a few days during the summer to align the curriculum and pay them for it. Right, so this is what we're looking at doing this upcoming year, but we weren't here at the end of at the end of the school year last year, so we we couldn't offer those opportunities. We did send a few things out to see if anybody was interested, but a lot of times staff are on you know they're on vacation, they've already planned their time, they they couldn't find um, care because it's last minute, right? And so we can't expect a, a a teacher or staff member to say, oh yeah, I can do that week because they've already made arrangements all summer, so. It becomes difficult for that. So. so do we have something in place? Because I feel like so many of our staff would absolutely take advantage of that. Absolutely. I feel like they would. I absolutely. Mean, I, oh, yeah. Moving forward, I mean, yeah. Lisa, could, I mean, we've we put, what, letters in already. Um, we got Hegarty in, um, foundations. So we've, we're doing a lot okay. already. And we don't want to throw too much at the staff because, you know, they're already yeah. taking on a lot. But we're putting some foundation things in getting them the, the trainings that they need to go along with the programs that we're also bringing in. So we're using some of the funding um, for that as well. Okay. Bill, sorry. So I'm sorry, this question came to me a little while ago, but I didn't want to interrupt anything. Sorry. You know, sorry, I'm going backwards a little bit. Um, so we talked about teachers and how difficult it is to hire teachers on a grant because their position is grant-based. Um, are we allowed, and I think I probably know the answer, but the question certainly needs to be asked from Jan. Are we allowed to hire a teacher on the budget and use the grant funds to pay the salary? In other words, are, are we allowed to bring a teacher in because we know we need this position, we know we need another Title I reading teacher. So we budget for it. Then when we do get the grant money, you know, say the grant money is enough to help cover that salary, then can we use the grant money to cover that salary? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so it's not like we have to necessarily, so if we can find the room in the budget, um, you know, something that Bert's talked about, you know, for this Title I teacher, then we can budget it, and then if the Title I funds come to help cover, hey, bonus, yeah. you know, but if not, at least we're not 
hiring a teacher on a gamble. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we've, we're doing that already. All right. I didn't mean to derail us there, but no, I, no. It's this I is the first time because you had, had requested this, and so I really want you to to ask all the questions that you you have, right? Because I, I do want you to get an understanding of how how these work, how our grants and stuff work. This so negative aspect of uh, be, rolling it over, can it be denied? Because you have can it be denied? Yeah. yeah. Nope, it rolls over. We just send, I, you know, I have to sign a document out requesting it to be rolled over, and they roll it over. That's it, just Title I. Title I's the only grant that rolls over. Does it, does it affect ne next year's application? Nope. Okay, so they gave you the money, and you, ha you can do, <clears throat> you've got to spend it. Yes, but I will tell you this. They do not take fondly over a lot of money like this rolling over, because what they say is, we're giving you this money because it, it shows that you need it, but yet you're not using it. So they don't take too friendly to that. So, okay, so we try to use as much as we possibly can every year. Okay. Was the rationale uh, for 21-22, which you weren't here, for uh, not using it? I'm not sure. I can't answer that question. I don't know what the rationale for. Who would make that decision? Who would make the decision for last, if we get the money? No, for who, like where that title on in the fact you have 91,000 extra like left over. So, so who makes the decisions? We, we a, a couple of things, right? So we reach out to buildings, right? So we, we talk to the building principals and stuff and see what the needs are. Um, Bryn will talk to staff and say, you know, what are some of the needs that you have in your buildings and get, get those types of things in place. Um, Carrie talks to staff as well and says, you know, what are some of the programs that you'd like to see or some of the workshops that you'd like to go to? You know, um, an example would be um, 504, right? We have a, we, 504 is, is um, we have IEPs and then 504. So 504 is if maybe a student has ADHD or something else and they need some type of accommodations in their classroom to help them be successful. So we have, we have staff members that are doing title, um, doing 504s for families that haven't necessarily gone through the training that they need to do the 504s. So Carrie would, will reach out and say, okay, here's a 504 training. You know, she's going to a training that's going to allow her to train others to do, to do that. There's, um, we, we've noticed that we don't have very many staff that are trained in um, Orton-Gillingham, which, which is a specialized program, or Wilson, which is a specialized program in special ed. So Carrie sent something out and said, who's interested in my special ed team at being trained in this? And so we reach out to teachers and ask those questions, and so they respond back. I'd be interested. And then we work on setting that up for them. During the summer, we would do the same thing. You know, is there, if we get anything, sometimes through the um, superintendent association, I get things that, that say, here's some courses that are going to be offered during the summer at, you know, at whatever facility. Um, and then we'd send it out to staff and say, is anybody interested in taking part of this? I know Bryn had sent something out recently um, doing, there's a couple of programs that um, the Promethean Boards is a training that we're going to be offering to staff. So she sent that out and said, who's interested in doing this training? And we actually have one of our, our own people doing the training. So they're getting paid to do the training, and it's after school. So they're getting paid to do the training. We're doing the training, and we're paying the teachers to go to the training. She's also looking at doing a boot camp, computer boot camp, that has to do with different programs that you can do on the computer with, with your students um, in, through Google, all those types of things. That went out to staff. Who's interested in doing this um, type of training? So, so we offer trainings um, throughout. Bill, did you have your hand up? No, I'm sorry. Okay. I did. I did. Okay. okay. Bert. <laughs> I'm going to call it 92,000. So in the last year's budget, as it rolled around, uh, we should have found a home for that money to educate kids or whatever it was, whatever, whatever it was going for, could have gone for, should have gone for. Because coming out with a surplus benefits us now. I understand that. We can roll it over. Uh, but the job was to spend that money to get something done, and it didn't get spent. So I would hope that under the new administration as we go forward, we would look at that and 
like a plane coming into land. You don't do that. And so you bring it in and get it as close to zero as you can. Exactly. Well, you're going to see for it if you, when you turn to the next page, the 22 and 23. So the allocations were a little bit lower. They're 495,000. We'll say 496, right? So that's that's two hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars less than the year before. That's a lot less. That's a lot less. Now, now, that could be because people didn't fill out the forms, right? But it could also be because of the fact that last year they had a large rollover. We don't know. We don't know that piece. But um, there was also. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there was also a lot of questions surrounding this with. COVID and everybody having access to free breakfast and lunch and which yes. year do you use and, and things like that. Absolutely. So that, I think that is a potential component. Right. But you'll look at what you'll see is out of the 495000 <coughs> currently, there's only $24,000 left. We're already spending it. So we have $24,000 left so far for this year, plus we'll be getting the 91000 that's rolling over. So we're already, you're already spending <coughs> money. So what you're saying is... We are now doing what we should have done. So we are spending the money. Yes, we are spending the money. Without it being a spending spree. I think spending yes. sprees have gotten the district in trouble before, if my history is correct. So I just want to be... Or you're down to the sap. It's either we asked for too much money, back there looking historically 21, 22, we either asked for too much money or we didn't pay attention to what we're spending and didn't spend it down to the bottom. And, and to me, when we wind up being 211, that is a problem. Because that money could have gone somewhere. The people that were missing, and, and Lisa, Lisa's uh, uh, statement, maybe one could have been there. Uh, so we need to, um, if we get it, we need to put it in place. Right, and so you'll see that um we actually jumped up to 13 staff for this out of this salary here. That's salary benefits. So that's the reading teacher, math specialist, the family liaison, Title I teachers, and then before and after school staff. And then um, supplies and materials for intervention groups. So that's what we're spending, what we've spent that money on so far. Um, and obviously we're waiting for the other 91,000 to hit over as well as um, we have the 24 right now. So we're, we're just, we don't want to go too fast because we want to see what everybody needs, right? And we also want to be able to offer summer, summer stuff for staff, right? So we're, we're looking at that. And sometimes your summer program comes out of Title I. So we have to take that into account as well. So our summer program will be coming out of this money. Title II, as I stated before, Title II um, is, has to do with professional development. So it's anything that will benefit the students, but it's done by the staff. So any type of workshops or um, people that we bring in, that's what a, um, the Title II would cover. All right. And so in the 21-22 school year, uh, that, uh, you'll see the 21-22 school year, we still have $8,045.59 left in that one, and that expires in 2023. So what gets really difficult with the, with the next with all the titles moving forward is that you have multiple years. So currently we actually have two Title II open. We have the 21-22 and we have the 22-23. So we have those two years currently open right now. Um, the one that we yeah. So the one that we just That's next year. Yes. So the one that just closed would have been the previous year, which would have, we would have had to spend all the money by um, the 1st of September. Two years. So these ones are two years. So these are still currently open, and we have these, this money in our, currently in our, bud, in our um, titles to spend. Right? So when you look at this, the, um, this is where we did Frontline. So we're going to be bringing Frontline into, into the school district. Right now we're working on building it. So what Frontline does is it's, um, yeah. Besides the fact, you know, medication stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the no, heartworm. No. <laughs> so, so currently what happens is if a staff member is going through recertification, they have to, to keep all of their, um, you go to a workshop and they give you a certificate. So you have to keep those certificates for three years until the next one comes, until, so you can send them in. 
you keep them in a three-ring binder, and the binder gets, Lisa probably can attest to this, gets, Ed too, gets huge, and sometimes what ends up happening is you'll have a teacher that'll start going to other teachers and saying, hey, did you remember when we had that workshop in June? Do you have the, the receipt for that? Right? Ed's like, yeah. <laughs> and so they do that, so they're running around. So what this does is this, this makes everything paperless. So now what happens is all the credentials go into this system, all the teachers, all the staff members in the district go into this program. And what this program does is if, if a staff member, if we hold, if, if we hold the professional development day, we put it in this program, staff go in, they sign up for it, and it automatically in like a little case for them to hold. So it holds it in this thing, and they put it with it. So someone that may have multiple credentials can choose which credential it's going towards. So, um, for instance, some people may have four or five credentials. So they have to do 45 hours for every credential and 30 hours district, right? So they have to keep all those hours for all those credentials in this book. Instead, now we're bringing it to frontline. So if, and it also, if somebody wants to go to a workshop, they would have to request the workshop and it has to go through this whole process. Now it's streamlined. So for instance, if a teacher wanted to go to a workshop that that the district was gonna be paying for because it's in their contract, they would go on, fill out the form, it would go to their building principal, their building principal would look at it and say, yep, this meets the criteria of what our school goals are, or the staff goals, then it gets kicked to the SAU office, um, Melissa would look at it and say, yep, and this is how much money they have left to track the money because teachers get X amount of money per their contract, would track that, and then it would come to me and we'd look and say, yep, strategic plan, it goes back. So that could possibly take a week. Prior to, it could take a lot longer, the process. And then once it's approved, they just go in and say it's complete, they submit through that their um, mileage, and then they get paid their mileage. So it's just a, it's a, a fast track way to do all that. And it keeps, it holds, it houses everything for us. So we could look at it and say, um, you haven't done so many hours. So a building principal could now sit down with the, the teacher and have those conversations with the teacher during, whether it be their evaluation at the beginning of the year, and say, all right, I'm noticing now that you have four, creden you have four credentials, but you only have 20 hours, and you're expiring at the end of this year. What are you going to do to get all these hours? Right? So this is going to be right there. They print it right out, and they just look at it. So this way they know i got to stay on top of this staff member to make sure they have the hours. Or, okay, I see that you're already done with your hours, great, right? So this way they know, okay, I have this staff member that is done with their hours, so I know we're going to be able to offer them a contract next year. Versus, oh boy, we got to help this and support this staff member to make sure they get the hours that they need so we can offer them a contract because they're going to get renewed. Because we're in charge of saying, yes, these people met all of the criteria needed, and I sign off saying, yes, they've met all the criteria, to get their next three years of credentials. And so I have to be, have a way as well to track that because that's on me, right? I have to make sure that yes, they have all their hours that they need and I sign off saying yes, they have all the hours that they need. And then based on that, they get their credentials. It also offers a way to house any type of evaluations. So evaluations can be housed in there as well. So there's all kinds of ways that you can use Frontline. There's, um, there's what they call micro-credentialing in there, so a staff member can go on and take, um, take a, a micro-credentialing class that they need to take. We're looking at putting on all of our required do, um, workshops that we have to, to take, um, you know, bloodborne pathogens, um, first oh, aid man. CPR, oh, not first aid CPR, um, suicide, all those things are going to be going into that program, so that way it's easier, it's easy access for staff. And we can keep them instead of a staff saying, um, they get their, their certificate and then they have to send it. They, I, I, I think they get sent to me and Sally because it seems like that's what's happening. And so it, we're supposed to be housing the, credential, the, the certificates, but that's not really what the certificates should be because it's the responsibility of the staff member to make sure they're, they're meeting and all. And this is, this is what it's doing. It's almost like an accountability system, right? It's holding everybody accountable. It's holding us accountable because we need to have those conversations with the staff and the staff know that we have to because they have to go in and fill what their goals are for the year. And the, the, the building level principal is required to sit down with them and go over their goals and find out how can I help you achieve these goals. So that's what Frontline is. That's the short version of it, Bert. Yeah, I just don't ask for the long version. <laughs> <laughs>
He's like, oh, why did I ask? But, but also in, in um, Title II is the PD opportunities that I, that I talked about, which is professional development. We're also creating what's called professional development libraries. So we're looking at some of the things that our staff are currently doing in their classrooms. Um, for instance, some of, our, some of our staff, which eventually we're going to get all of them, um, have gone through a responsive classroom. So we're looking at getting the books because you, if you go to a class and you learn about all these great ideas and then you leave and there's, you, you can't take anything with you unless the teacher buys them themselves. But, so what we're doing is we're building up a library for our staff to have those resources available. So that's another thing that we've, we've used this money for. Um, we're also using it for, for um, competency work. So we have somebody that we've hired to come in to our um, district and work with our staff on competencies and making sure they're aligning with the state. Ment oh, go ahead. Yeah. Is it possible uh, when you go through Avatar and do your, the, your tax card, they've got all these abbreviations, but up there you can go on to what you can go to this 8 and a half by 11 sheet, which has uh, NHLI there, and it explains what it is? Yeah, well, normally because what I would do if it's a presentation, you know, I, I would um, write it out and then put the parentheses after it. So, yeah, so I would do that, definitely do that. <laughs> uh, mentoring for new staff. So we, we have the mentoring program that we, we pay our, ment our staff members to mentor the new staff that are coming in. Before the school year, we have a few days that we have staff come in. And um, they, we pay them for that because it's not, it's not in their contract. It's out of contracted hours. We're also looking at adding into here a uh, mentoring for paraprofessionals. So that's another component that we're adding into there. And equitable services, what, that, what equitable service means is that um, as a district, you have to look at any schools that are in Newport that your students that would normally attend your district go to. For instance, Montessori School. So we're obligated to give the Montessori School part of all of our grants to use for our students that attend that school. And so how it works is anything that, like professional development that they go to, it's supposed to benefit our students that go there. And the money is based upon how many of our students attend. And so if they, um, if they spend any of the Title I money and they buy supplies, the supplies that come, they usually come to us, we're supposed to put on their property of the Newport School District, and then it goes to them. And they're only, sp which is, this is hard, right? They're only supposed to use it with the Newport students and if they decide they don't want it anymore, they have to give it back to us because it belongs to us. So that's how that's, that's supposed to work. Now, we don't have the um, title police that go in there and say, okay, that's not a Newport student, so you can't be using the blocks with them. So we don't, we don't police it like that. Um, we just trust that the schools are, they know what the, what the um, rules are and they follow them. And then we're also required, so Bryn meets with the directors of those programs or the, the, pro, the principals of those programs and they go over um, what they're using the items for and if there's any supports and other things that they may need. And that is for all of our grants, every grant we have. They're in our title grants and our um, IDEA and special ed grants. So title two for this year, um, again, equitable services and new staff. Current, our current budget, so this is the, the first budget it talks about we have $8,000 left. The second one we have $34,000. But now, if you look below um, where it says continuing work with New Hampshire Learning Incentive, that's the NHLI. So that's normally how I would do it, Bert, is you see how it says New Hampshire Learning Initiative? That is the NHLI. Um, and then PD opportunities, conferences and webinars. So we're looking to see what conferences and webinars our staff currently want to go to over this year or during the summer that we can offer for them to attend. That will all be through Title II funding. Then we go to Title IV. Title IV, has, it, it's access to a well-rounded education. And so what they do is they actually have three buckets that you have to use. And you have to use a percentage of the bucket. So it could be um, student safety, technology, those types. So they have those budgets. I can, I, what I can tell you is that um, it's very difficult to get something through for Title IV. So a lot of times what we end up doing um, is that we take the money and we, we can allocate it to a different title. 
So I can take it and say, I want to spend some of my Title IV money in Title II. So I can do that. But we do spend the money. So I don't want you to think we don't spend the money. We do spend the Title IV money. It's just um, having to meet the certain goals becomes very difficult. But so if you look at the 21-22 school year, um, summer camp supplies and staff salaries were taken out of there and the Tiger Calf after school program, that was taken out of there. And so that budget there, we still have the, the $17,219 left. And then the Title IV, because we still have this money left, we haven't started the Title IV budget for this upcoming year as of yet. So we have 38000 left there. So as you can see, it's lower than, than the 21-22 um, school year. So I can use my calculator and add all of those carryovers along, all of it. Well, these, I wouldn't consider them carryovers, Bert, and I'm sorry to interrupt, only because it's a two years. So you use so much one year, so much one year, and then so much one year, so much one year. So that's how you do it. So you do have an overlap of a year. The Perkins, if you look at the Perkins grant, Perkins is the, is the CTE grant. So that these are what we would use for um, anything that happens in our CTE program. So we, a lot of them is usually the same type of programs every year. So we have, and as you can see, the 21 and the, the 21, 22, 22, 23 allocations is the same exact amount. And we use them for the same things. The, the um, curriculum for 64 students, summer camp, the, the dues that we have to, to um, pay, Animal science material and skid steer, which I'm not too sure what skid steer is. I don't know if anybody. I know what she's. Okay, good. <laughs> what is that? It's like a um, small um, tractor thing, right? It's a. Oh, okay. Bert knows what it is. It's yeah. <laughs> it's right up Bert's alley. <laughs> and this grant, so this grant right here ends the. Um, we're looking at the 22-23, the 21-22 would be closed, the 22-23 is what we're, we're left to, to budget is the $23,845.09. And just to ask, I think the skid steer is used for the ag program, right? Yes. Oh. The forestry. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so what I, what I did in here is, even though it is closing, I still wanted to make sure that you were, that you saw what the CARES and ESSER money is being spent on. So the CARES, which was the very first allotted amount of money, that closes on the 20, that, that it says 930. But that's when I said all the money had to be spent by 91. They wanted it all spent and allocated for it before then, and then they close it out on the 30th. And so this is what it was spent for. So it was the furnishing, the um, tech integrator, nurses stipend, remote teachers, uh, PPE, cleaning supplies, Chromebooks and software, pop-up tents for the outdoor learning activities and equitable services. Because again, we have to pay out to other places for equitable services. That money is all spent. I can assure you of that because we spent it all. So we made sure we, we um, bought supplies to make sure our staff had the things that they needed. So we did do that. Um, I don't believe, I, I, tr I would rather, and, th and this is what I, I told um, Bren when we had the discussion, I would rather go over by $40 and have to find it somewhere in the budget than be under by $40. Because I don't like giving the state back money. And because what I worry about is they're going to say, well, you didn't spend it, so we're not going to give you as much. Right? And so I would rather spend it than, than not spend it. Um, the ESSER II, which was a big chunk of money, as you can see, um, what that was spent for, so our bleachers, the two buses, the ventilation at all schools and the HVAC system that was updated at toll. And that money is all spent in that. Okay. Okay. And that will close on 930. Bill. Um, of this year. Next year. Next year. 930 of next year. This, this cares, the ESSER 2? Yes. So we have an ESSER 3 as well. So this is just ESSER, this is what we call ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and then we have ESSER 3 as well. So, so with the ESSER 2, is that what the money, uh, like, we chose where to spend that money? Or was it, you know, this grant is for you to do this? 
there were certain stipulations that you had to yeah that you couldn't just spend it on so anything. this right so this so how the ESSER money worked right is is what would which is supposed to be done is you send out a survey to to the community to staff to students um, similar to what I just did a, a few weeks back and you say um, you know due to the, the guidelines we have to send a survey to see where the money would like to where everybody would like to spend the money and then based on that you can look to see where um, where people want the money spent sometimes you have a you form a committee that meets to talk talk about um, where should the money be spent a lot of times it's done building level you know you have conversations um, with your building um, principals sometimes some some districts what they did is they set up Google Docs so if a staff member was interested in something they could send a, a Google um, doc over to um, whoever was in charge of the ESSERs and say you know I'm interested in doing this and so you got to be careful because right? you may have somebody that, that says well I'm interested in doing um, handwriting without tears which is a, a program that is used and but yet all your classrooms are not using it so you would have to say well I'm going to deny that um, request because it's one teacher specific and we want all of our kids to have access to the same materials and so if for, for instance now all of a sudden all the, the say the elementary school teachers got together or all the fifth grade teachers got together and said well we want to we want to do handwriting without tears and that came across then we would look at it more seriously and have those conversations with them and say all right talk to me a little bit more of how you want to use this program and so that's what you do for those that type of money um, I know it wasn't this administrative team you know um, but so do, do we try to believe that the uh, public surveys determined that we needed air conditioning at the SAU? Does it say that we so so, air so it, we, we did these surveys, you know, apparently, you know, to determine where the money would be spent. Um, and, and so the public decided that the SAU needed air conditioning? I don't think there were surveys for those. Um, yeah, like I say, I don't know, it wasn't this administrative team. but. This is a type of thing that has a tendency to rub the town wrong. Um, but yeah. I, also, I also know that the SAU was so <coughs> hot they weren't able to work in there the year, the year before. Uh, so I spent uh, eight summers uh, in for, for those of us who were here, yeah. I wasn't on the school board, but the school board voted absolutely no and, oh. uh, to AC in that building. Okay. But I also know why this happened, because the money came and we had to use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. And that's why we got the buses, and that was the right decision. So now, uh, as a board, being that it's air conditioned, we can expect better things out of the SAU uh, in a more timely, accurate fashion. Um, Would it be safe to say that statement's not true because it's a two-year grant, it's good for another year? So technically, the money didn't have to be used last year, correct? That's according to the 9-30-2023, Mr. Beard. Yeah, so still got another and, year and that's, what, that's what I'm questioning, because it runs for another year. But yet, uh, I know we bought the buses because it would have been a project that was going to happen, didn't happen, and so we had to do it quickly. Uh, and that was the HVAC here, right? This one, well, this one says HV at toll. I w I w I'm not sure. I don't know if... I wasn't at the SAU <laughs> last year, but... Going forward, I, you're saying we would base this <laughs> type of grant on surveys sent out? Absolutely, I, and I have a survey that went out, and I can show you the results of that. Um, but I, I think for these old, the hard, the hard the thing for me, for, yeah. for no. the one that I just did, oh, okay. moving, moving forward, forward for the money that's left. Remember, they didn't um, do the survey for the yeah. last one. The, the part that, that, that's hard for me is that, um, and, I, and I don't want the, to be, this to be misconstrued in any way, but... The toll building in the high school and the middle school is extremely hot for our teachers and our students. And so I don't want people to think that it was my idea to put in an air conditioning in the toll building because it was extremely hot. Okay, because that would have not been where that would have not been my idea to put it in the toll building because I would have put it in the schools. So I just I, I just want to make that clear, there. and then, uh, but I just want to make sure that 
you know, because I know that our, I know for a fact I've been in the buildings and I know what the teachers go through. And it is in, I'm sure they, they can attest to it as well. It is very hot in those buildings. And so I just don't want it to be that, oh, it's in the SAU because, you know, this administration thought it was too hot because that, yes. that's not what it is. I not do that. I, as you can see, when you go to the toll building, you can look and see that there's all kinds of weeds and stuff. I don't want that done. I will take care of the weeding of that, that stuff myself. Please concentrate on our buildings. Lisa put in a request that the stairs were unsafe. They were fixed. I make a motion and to so, get the AC out of the toll building. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it would probably cost more money to. I'd rather put <laughs> AC or something in the other buildings. I do want to reiterate that I know it wasn't the okay. administrative team. And, oh, and yeah, I was just telling you what yeah, I was yeah, told. Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> well, I work, like yeah. I say, I worked at Toll for eight summers. I know how my Toll gets. Um, I also remember kids in uh, early fall, late spring at all three of the schools, because I've worked all three of the schools, um, and that kind of heat makes learning very difficult. So um, moving forward, my personal stance, I would be appalled to see offices getting air conditioning, but not classrooms. Moving As forward. would I. And, th and that's all I'm saying is moving forward. I'm not crucifying you guys for something that you didn't do, and I want to make sure you understand that. Um, but we're moving forward, and as we are, yeah, and I would be as I well. just needed a clarification because I'm pretty sure I came here as a citizen asking what we're spending the money on, and I got, I don't, I don't know, I can go back and watch the tapes, but I don't think I got like a straightforward answer, or that Mr. Morris, we're sending out a survey, so fill out the survey, and you'll see on there what our proposals are to spend the money on. So I, I'm just, this is all just news to me that, that there was, a, ch a choice to what we could spend the money on. I don't think. Like maybe the air conditioning at the elementary school. Like I was briefed, that, uh, is it the elementary school or the wherever we're doing? Because I know we're doing some work here, but it looks like there's a split up between. I'm pretty sure I was told that that was the ESSER funds was specifically mm -hmm. for air to purify air, whatever. Yes. Air yeah. I understand like that. I, I think I think I got the answer. I think I got the answer. I kept talking with Ed about what was, what was happening, and when the buses quotes came out for us to see, I questioned that. And what really happened was he had a large project that was planned, but it didn't make it through in the bid time. So that money was would would have been lost, or he had to put it somewhere else. And so many years ago, <clears throat> at a Board of Selectmen meeting on a CDBG grant, we were talking about a $350,000 grant. And some of the board was no, and some was yes. And Ed Salevich said, if we don't do it here, they'll use it to study mosquitoes in Louisiana. And so what Ed did was applied it to the buses. And I don't know what the rest was, but I'll bet it was the ventilation it told. And also, I remember at the time, I'm sorry to interrupt, Ed had all his ducks in a row and everything lined up, and then the state came back to us and said, oh, wait, no, there's still more that you have to do. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that, regardless that I, I believe the funds were spent, regardless of surveys, I don't think HVAC at all was on a survey, but that it was, things before, happened in the process. Before, before. <coughs> But for the new people on this board, sometimes uh, you, you need to dig for the answer of what really happened because uh, I've been long enough. We, back in prior administration, couldn't even get an audit done a year, year after it was supposed to be. And Ed straightened all of that out. The computer system was messed up. I could use a bad word to explain it and it got straightened around. So what Ed did with these monies was get as much of it as he could for us, and, and I believe that's what we're looking at. So somebody tell me different, if toll, if toll wasn't part of using up that money we would have lost, we all would have voted yes. If this board would have voted yes on the HIVAC system that we are using those four letters, 
uh, we all would have voted under those circumstances or lose the money. And so yeah. I'm pretty sure that. I and would have asked for an alternative. Excuse me? <laughs> I'm sorry. To uh, personally, I would have asked for an alternative. How about two more buses? I, mean, I agree 100% on what you're saying. I'm just, yeah. my question I mean, is, I see what you're saying. It says it closes in the year, though. It. Yeah. I just feel like that part of the information is not correct. And that's what gets me. Not the, what the money was spent on, per se, is if it was spent on that because it's, hey, we're going to lose it, absolutely, because I'd rather use the money in this school, in this district, to polish that floor 30 times than to just give it to some study of mosquitoes in Louisiana. But if it's, well, we actually have another year to use that money, and we just spent it. I, and I think this is the right way to go about it. You know, like we're we're rehashing the past, yep. obviously because no, there it's was good. confusion. Because I I came here for like two years as a citizen trying to. This is the kind of stuff though that anybody can look at and say, oh, we got 1.8 million dollars of taxpayer money for bleachers, buses, ventilation. I understand what we're spending the money on. But, but the weird that, thing is the bleachers. Well, not all, not all was like that two years ago, he said. What, what's here? All well, and that. some of it out of, um, and I just talking with Diane about it, ESSER 2, some of that money is going to also help fund the CTE. I believe it's ESSER 2 that's under. Yes. Yeah. yes. And it, and it, and it went out for other heating systems. Yes. So uh, I'm, we had I'm to coming, get I'm coming to, to ask if Matt is speaking, because I, I, I when, he, when, he, when he first came in, I was very unimpressed because we weren't making an audit. I couldn't find out where we were. And then when I found out why we couldn't and what the rationale was, and he turned that all the way around. I mean, that's like, that's like heading for a cliff and, and he find, found the brakes and, and fixed it. And so when this happened, I questioned it, the buses. And he didn't mention anything else, but I believe that's it. And Diane, you would know that. You told me that all you had to do was pick up and call. Yeah. Uh, it appears that this board would like an explanation. You want uh, to call them right now. <laughs> where, where the, the 1.876 million went, all of the projects, including the beginning and, and the end. Yes, yeah, but I think ESSER 2, I believe, is CTEs in that one as yeah. well. Yes, yes. Yeah. And for a matter of fact, that's what, for a matter of fact, reduced part of the bonding mm -hmm. was the fact that we had that money and could use it. Right, and the state gave us permission. So for the HVAC portion. Bill. Um, so, again, you know, as frustrating as it is to see our conditioning at home, I, I'm not here to crucify anybody for that. Moving forward, I just want to make sure everybody understands that that would not be. Um, I do like this layout, though. Um, you know, as Steve said, it prevents us from having to dig into the past to find out where the money was spent because we can see it and it's clear and it's easy. Might not like where the money was spent, but at least we can see where the money was spent. Yeah, and, we'll, and we can do updates like this all the time to, to keep you posted on that where would be the nice. money is going, so that way you have an idea. Can we move out to SR3? What? Oh, I'm sorry, Tim, I You're apologize. Fine. I apologize, okay. go ahead. Do you know what's left of SR2? So do you want, we can go to Esther 3 while yeah, she's doing that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The follow-up question to that would be, do we have it budgeted? Right. So do we know what's left and do, do we know where we're spending it? And that may be a larger question than for tonight. Which is fine. Yeah. yeah. But if not, let's make a plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the CT, is, um, the CT update is coming out of Esther 2. So I think the majority of the money left is, is the CT. Yeah. You still want me to look at it if you want to? I, I, I want to say it's over a million dollars. There's, there's over a million dollars coming out of ESSER. I think it's 1.4 yeah. million. Yeah, that sounds about right. To yeah. help the CTE. So between two and three, there's 1.4 to 6 million dollars that's going for the air conditioner here. Okay. Can we actually get an accounting of it, though? Uh, uh, and then, then, then we'll actually know. Just a, a piece of paper which uh, says ESSER 
one, two, and three. Nessa one did this. Nessa two did this. Nessa three did that. Yeah, I can get you that. Do you want me to send that on on Friday? Or you want the next school board meeting or? When, whenever. It, it's it's not an emergency. Yeah, it's just an update. It's just so that we. No. Someone in the public asks us a question. We can answer it. Try it at least. Yeah. What the hell did you do with that two million dollars? <laughs> Yeah, we got I can give you amounts. I'll, this is what we did, and this is the amount. So we did this yep. is the amount. Yep. Yeah, I can I can get that together. Yeah, that would be nice. And I, I really think it is uh, creative, um, and I, I smile at it. Bleachers for social distancing. <laughs> I think that was one of the things we, that had, we to, had to come up with. Yeah, it had to be stuff yeah. that was not distancing. a first choice. Bleachers yeah. were not a first and choice. And I believe that also was part of retaining the funds. And it was, because Ed and I had a lot of discussion. I'd had discussions about bleachers. Bleachers, Ed, I had quite a few discussions on because I wasn't too keen on that as a selling point of using ESSER funds, but again, it was a time issue. So I think that we were lucky to get away with that uh, rationale, but I think that's ahead of the Louisiana mosquitoes. <laughs> All right, so for the ESSER 3, you'll see that it's staffing. There's three elementary teachers, a high school remote teacher, and this was in the past, right? And a computer tech. Um, the technician, classroom library for six classrooms at Richard and the Tiger Calf. So currently, you see what's left to budget. However, there's still salaries for this school year and for next school year, so we've done it for two years, that need to come out of this budget, and the second half of the ventilation project from ESSER 2. And we're not quite sure what that's going to be yet, but that's going to be coming out of that money. And I can try to get exactly what that's going to be, so it's more uh, up to date. that I asked for and I hope the board wants now. Do we have to make a motion to get that or is it? Are we all in agreement that we want this list? Then I'm yeah. okay. I think I I should, yeah, I think it's just a request. I don't, I don't think, think you have to make it. It's not one either. person asking. So it would be good for all of us to have. Right. So we could have one, two, and three so we know where we stand. Yep, I'll do one, two, and three. I'll do what the total that we were given, um, what everything was spent on, and what the balance is, and when it ends. And what is And what's encumbered. Um, mm -hmm. in order to get us to September 24th. Yep. Well, I think that will answer that question once I do that form. So I'll get that. Um, and the CARES one was just the COVID one, is that correct? CARES is like SR1, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, none of this is Biden money, is it? The very, the very last page are local grants that we have, and so you'll see that, that um, it gives you what the grants are and what they are um, expected to be used for. So <coughs> the Eldridge grant, and you'll see that money has to go to, goes to, is going towards the CTE program. The Exxon grant is, going, is um, for science night at Richards. So they give specifics. The golf and ski grant, this is to go towards varsity golf and the ski team. And so this, the money, the $10,000, I've already reached out to, to Jeff. He, he was unaware that he even had that money. And so what he's doing is he's looking to um, have all the things that they need to, when they go to, to their competitions, as well as the golf. So we've had a lot of, of students not participate in whether it be golf or skiing because they can't afford equipment to buy the equipment because it's very expensive. And so I have approved and, and spoken to him about buying that stuff to have on hand so that way we all of our students have the opportunity to participate in those sports. Um, so he's doing that. He's currently doing that. Mm -hmm. um, then the next one is the, Hyper, the HOPE grant, which is the $3,000. That's going to go towards the start of a robotics club. And then um, the IRC, which is a, CT, a CTE grant, that's another thing that's going towards the CTE project. Then the, the SW Community Service Grant. So that has the balance, you see that in there. And that says that it goes towards cards and birth certificates for families. So sometimes what happens is we may have a um, homeless family that moves into the community. And one of the requirements is in order to go to school, eventually you have to, to show whether it be a social security card or a birth certificate or something saying that this is your child. And a lot of times they can't <coughs> afford that. And so this grant helps us get those for them. The lovely grant, that the remaining balance of that, which is the 7750 
that is what we use towards our snack shack to help build that. Um, then we have the 275, which is, goes towards vouchers for clothing for students in need. Once again, that could be either homeless or just students, uh, families that need um, clothing. The music grant, so if you look, that's $15,000 for over three years, and that's gonna go towards our music programs in our school, which I'm really happy to report that the, um, all three of our schools, they're gonna all have music programs, so that way they can build up to each other, so we're gonna have a more robust, eventually, high school band. And so our elementary ha now has a music teacher that's gonna um, some band and chorus type of things, and then middle and high school. So, and we already, the um, middle school has already started, so they're gonna be having a concert with their students, yeah. I believe um, elementary as well. Music program. One thing that I think we've, as a community, have noticed over the years: uh, the longer we hold on to a teacher, the bigger the program becomes. Um, it's once we start turning over teachers that we start losing chorus members or band members. So, um, something to consider. I think we can see that with anything, right? The the longer we keep our staff, the higher our our scores go, right? The more turnover we have, it's, you see the trend with, with, you know, and I think it's very important to, to be able to keep our staff for a long period of time. Was the uh, Steve and Tim grant? Uh, not listed here. <laughs> <laughs> the proceeds get all eaten up. Yeah, yeah. Quite better. The playground, yeah. So you'll see that's the one that's going to Richards. The Rotary Grant that is um, that has a balance of $688. The Wellborn Grant, which was spent on the boardwalk and outside classroom supplies. And then the Whole Foods Grant is $662.51. So these are all our current grants that we have available to our district. I hope that was helpful. And I know you had requested to, to get an update on that. Hopefully that helped. I, I, I got to say, don't don't take the questions and interrogation wrong. Uh, we've never been in this good a shape. Period. Oh, I, I so, don't. I don't. So you're, I, you're, I don't mind the questions because then it just prepares me for the next time. Yes, but the, you, it's it's not that you are faulted. It's that <clears throat> we need to know going forward because we didn't know in the past and couldn't get to the information. And uh, so uh, this is open doing it for the public, this is great. So, so I'm going to, you're, in your packet, you should have the timeline that, uh, for, the, for the SB2 town meetings. And so um, what Diane has done is she has taken the, the timeline in the form that Jenna had sent over and created it. So you'll see that it gives a timeline on when all the items should take place throughout the budget season. And Diane, would you like to speak on this? Yes. And I have to make a couple corrections because I did it in a different template and I copied it the last no. minute into yours. So this no worries. And so mine, I think I only had like the election date and the deliberative yeah. down. So thank you for making that. Um, so I just need to fix where it says preliminary budget delivered to school board. That's actually November 10th, not October 10th. I'll, I'll lose my mind if I try to get it to you by October 10th. And the next the next date is says October 17th. That should be November 17th. Um, so then to answer Bert's question from earlier, if the preliminary budget is delivered to the school board by November 10th. Yeah. Right now, the first budget advisory committee meets sometime around December 15th. Right. So I put question marks there because I don't know when right. they and meet. So yeah. I just kind of threw a date in there, but I need to find out from them when they meet. And last year was a little wonky, but um, wonky. wonky in that <laughs> oh, in that wonky, wonky in that. Previous administration reached out and, and didn't hear back until quite okay. quite close to the, the deadline that we needed, but it, it all worked out. So I also threw some dates <coughs> in there that you're not scheduled to meet, so I kind of, I think we need to add those dates to the calendar. Okay. November 17th is not a normal meeting date for you, um, but I, we to, in order to meet the timeline of the SB2 schedule, 
we need to add that date if you guys can meet. Which one is that? November 17th, because they're meeting on the 10th. And then they don't meet again in November because of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So I was hoping to meet the 10th and then meet the following week, the 17th as well. And then the, the Saturday, the 19th, is the workshop day. Right. And I know previously, depending on what is going on in November, if it's really only the budget, yeah. then we can make it the 10th or the 17th. We don't have to meet both times. Um, but we need, to, we need to have it done by the 17th. Yeah. Okay. And, and then, then the 19th, that Saturday, would be our budget workshop, which is an all-day. Right. So you're thinking you can... Two, two meetings with the board and the budget? Well, I'm hoping the two meetings and then the, the workshop day. And the workshop date is? Is the 19th, November 19th. All right, so let's take a step back. Preliminary budget to the board, November 10th. That's a Thursday. Yeah. And then the 17th. Budget presentation to the board. That will be all elementary, middle, high CTE budget. Yeah. And then they make their presentation to us, and then the 19th is our time. Right. So to digest that. Yep. So if we need another date in there, we can. But you know, looking at your schedule, I only saw you meeting once. So it's like, no. how many how many meetings can I add sure. to, to you? Sure. I don't want to switch two of the dates. You have it says eleven nineteen and then it goes eleven seventeen. So you don't want to switch that. Well, that's just that. speak, that's just the seventeen was um, the budget could be made public on a website. It, um, I mean, we can make it the nineteenth as well. It's just when it actually well, gets published. No, what I'm saying is you have it below. So if we just put it above, well, so that way we can do checks. Okay. I'm very checked. Okay. So I I have to check it off. I didn't. It was her calendar, so I just. Followed the same oh, path. I'll, oh, take the blame. Can, I'll take the blame on that. That's fine. <laughs> so is it okay if she changes that? Um, right, yeah, perfect. it's fine. Um, so I would say I'm I'm open to however many meetings this board feels that they need. I think it's challenging to schedule them right now without seeing anything. Mm -hmm. That's my thought. But and I'm we can add anything. dates as we yes. get closer. It's just <clears throat> I at least wanted to get two dates, two to three dates in November on your on your schedule because I do believe we need that. Okay. I'm all for having the deliberative session on the first meeting that we can have it because if there's a snow issue, then it gives us more, you know time to have another one. So I'm shooting for the deliberative to be February 4th. Yep. Any other thoughts from board members about meeting dates, whether adding more? I'm just thinking uh, with that there's not going to be enough time there. So I'm, I'm trying to think of another way. Do you do the budget in sections? In other words, would you do 1100 and then set it aside here and then build next? It's, those are really the departments, the administration to deliver those budgets. Um, so it's up to them. I mean, it's all part of their building. So I would think they're making the actual presentation on those budgets. Yeah, so what, so what the plan's going to be is that Diane and I are going to go to each school with their budget. We'll give them their budgets. And then we're going to go to each school and meet with the building principal and go over <coughs> their budget lines to see what their needs are, what can we change, what, do, what can we remove, and look at that. So we'll do that to, to each building. Each building is going to be responsible for their budget and they're going to be responsible for reporting out their budget to the board, as well as being there at the, the day that we have a, a, any meetings with the public to be able, if there's questions about their budget, and their budget and everything will be posted right online, as well as in that big book that I had talked about. And is facilities and IT also presenting their own as well? Yes, everybody's going to present their own. So it's not going to be a one big it's not going to, so what will happen is, for instance, um, at Richards, the building principal will report out his 1100s and what he's utilizing them for and um, if he needs more or, you know, so he has to justify all of his numbers. Stay on 1100 for mm -hmm. So we're not going to see 1100 for all schools. 
right. we're going to see three 1100s. Yes. So we'll each each that. each school will have its own budget, and it'd be presented that way to the board and to the public. Yes, you're going to see more than that because you'll see CTEs. CTEs. You're going to see the each each one of the buildings. You're going to see buildings and grounds. You're going to see curriculum. You're going to you're going to see them all. You're going to see all the budgets. They're going to be broken down by every um, program manager. So Carrie will have her own budget that she's going to report out on her 1100s. Um, Chad will have his own budget that he's going to report out on his 1100s. So, so you're, going to, you're going to duplicate what the town has done? Town I, I, town I'm done not sure what the town does, so I'm going to town uh, say yes. because that's departments what's for years. Yeah, yeah that's, so th that's what I'm used to. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we're going to do. So everyone's responsible for their own budget. And they're responsible for reporting out on their budgets. And they're responsible for taking the questions and answers on why they want to make any changes or adjustments to we, their budgets. So in that, we include last year's done the same way for a history. You'll have last year's what their budget was, what for the new budget is going to be. And we should also have the default budget. In not lumped, budget. but individually. So yes. we'll, know, we'll know Richards, we'll have Richards last year and mm -hmm. Richards new. Yep. Okay. Bill? So um, my question is something that Bert brought up earlier when we were talking about budgeting. Uh, Bert mentioned, you know, I want to look at these numbers and, hey, if I don't need it at the middle school, why can't I move it to the elementary school? Mm -hmm. So by breaking out building budgets like that and telling each building principal, this is your budget, this is your budget, this is your budget, um, are you going to have that flexibility? to say, oh, never mind, Shannon, you know, we're not giving you this because, you know, we're going to take it back and give it back down to the elementary school. Yes, because they're going to have to justify why they have that position. So they're going to have to come with a strong enough argument to say why they need <coughs> that position. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, then, can, I, can I just say, I feel like we've, the budget I'm looking at now currently has been level funded to some extent and it's not real anymore because it stayed in the same lines it originally was in and it really doesn't belong there. So I need to move stuff around right now because I'm over on lines and, and under based on be, I'm dealing with this budget that was given to me <laughs> and it wasn't a real budget to begin with. And we need a real budget. So that's why each department's got to actually go through, tell me what they need. I'll make notes in the system so we know what makes up each line. And we, you need a real budget. So. so it sounds like to me, we'll stick with these dates. I would anticipate that we may need more. And as mm -hmm. we get closer to November 10th and November 17th, we can make that decision as a board. I, um, I mean, this here and there trying to juggle schedules. I get it. Um, if I do, I will uh, perhaps shoot you an email like, hey, I've been looking through this. This is what I'm thinking about. Can you guys deal with this? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, a couple times a month, you know, to juggle yeah. my schedule, I could do start adding in those other couple of weeks. It's a busy time. That's and it's a busy time for yeah. families, too. So, yes. you know, yeah. But just so you know, okay. I will say active. Even if I'm not sitting here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll report out any concerns. And you can always reach out to us at any time, too. Mm -hmm. so. oh, yeah, I know where your office is. Okay. And it's heated. Um, it's All right. So does that bring us to committee report outs? That's what I have next. Because high school sports is already gone? Yep. Okay. Um, I'll just quickly report out that Bill and I uh, met with Diana and Donna. Uh, right before the meeting um, because we are entering into negotiations with the Newport support staff. So those are going to begin uh, Monday, correct? Anybody else? Uh, the CTE, prep, I think we're going to schedule to actually come to the board and brief. There's a lot of stuff going on with the CTE project. Uh, the cost of everything everything has gone up roughly 25 to 28 percent so we're looking at a 25 to 28 percent reduction in what we thought we were going to get six months ago even three months ago so anyway that's where we're at so we're kind of they're going to come and brief us and give us a whole overview of what's going on and where we're at but 
Yeah, Steve and I talked to, to Donna about this, and I just felt like it wasn't fair just to put Steve on the hot seat with a 25 to 28 percent <laughs> increase in costs that there needs to be other members of that committee there. So that will be on an upcoming board meeting because um, I know people are concerned about it. It's actually, I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. So um, I went to the meeting and um, we had a discussion about the changes and things that they wanted to do. And so I had said that um, I want them to come and present. So on October 13th, they will be presenting in front of the district. So we'll add, if that's okay with you, to add that to our agenda so that way we have anyone from the community that is interested in finding out more about the CTE renovations and what changes that may occur. Um, we ask them to come to that meeting or, you know, watch on TV or um, zoom in. And so that we will have the um, organization here. Um, I can't even, I always forget how to say the name. Oh, La Valley Brunzinger? La Valley Brunzinger, yeah. They'll be coming here to um, report out on it and as well as show us the before and after, what we were looking at before and what they're proposing we do. Okay, Bert. So I went and sat in for a little while uh, and uh, this is going to be a, a big deal. Capital B all the way through. So it's going to have to be explained succinctly, get rid of the acronyms and abbreviations and et cetera, because if you want to sell this to the public, uh, it can't be like what I heard there. It was, uh, um, I give kudos to Ed. Ed was the best and most direct speaker during that time that I was there. And uh, it went well, but it, in the terminology, the terminology's got to change. The, the presentation has to be detailed. There has to be something up there that shows us where, we, where the building was going to be and where, it's, what, where what's going to be moved. All of that is going to be explained in detail. And if, it's, if 15 minutes is set aside, um, it'll be a disaster. That's, that's a larger conversation. Yeah, it's got to be deep, it's got to be succinct and clean. All of the unnecessary words have to get out of it. It has to be a real business presentation of this is why we did it and this is how we're going to solve it. Or else, it ain't going to work. Tim. Can I get notified of one of the meetings there so I can start attending that? That's allowed, right? Well, I mean, you're my alternate, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you can go, I guess, right? I guess that would be an Ed, an ed question, maybe. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't see a problem with it, personally. Certainly, there's not a quorum there. If, if Bert shows up, then that, yeah, we can deal with that. Not a big deal. I'm, I, it is, I, I, I went because of um, a discussion that we had just to get a feel of what was happening there at, at the meeting. And I, I left the meeting saying, um, everybody's here is on task, doing what they're supposed to be doing, and it looks good. But I also walked away saying, hey, um, we've got a problem. And if we don't use this money, um, it's a catastrophe. So somehow we've got to come up with a workable solution. And so I have confidence that the board will do that but I am worried about the presentation being too technical and not understood. If we have viewers on NCTV, we gotta get to, to every one of them with what it is so they know, so that it doesn't get blown out of proportion on social media that this and that is not happening, or is happening. Yeah, I don't know if I would have the architects to present. It's not their school. That but uh, my recommendation would be, just from the meetings I go to, it would be to have a rehearsed briefing, because the architects get into, they, they don't say the right things, at least not in that forum. Like, it's not 
that's not their building. They're helping us to reach our vision, but it's our school. That's our project. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I can always meet with them prior to anyway to go over. Um, I, that wouldn't be my plan because I wouldn't want them to present something that I don't know about anyway. Um, I don't like to be caught off guard like that. And so the expectation would be that they would have to meet with me anyway okay. and go over what the presentation is going to be. Um, so that way, if, if there's questions that I have, they need to be able to answer those as well. Because um, I, you, you saw, Fair I'm enough. not very quiet at meetings sometimes, so. <laughs> Thank you. I, I mean, that, that'll handle uh, By all means, you'll be able to tell who can brief. But based on my meetings, I would, re like, if this is going on the television for the town to look at, they don't want a salesman Correct. talking fast, using the word, like, Big words, yeah. <laughs> well, it's not even just big words, mean, but, but sometimes they have a way of talking at you, at, at you mm -hmm. as a, like they're salesmen or they know more about, and, and they do, don't get me wrong, they obviously know more about architecture than all of us on that committee, but sometimes it's the tone that's delivered. I don't okay. know. It's my take on it. Like if I'm watching it and I'm getting brief by these architects who are talking fastly and they're telling us how we can't do something or any, you, know, you know what I mean? It needs to be brief though. Hey, this is what happened because of the economic situation in this country. Your dollar is now worth 25% less than it was in spending. That's the truth. That's why we're here right now is our dollar is worth less. And because of that, we've made these decisions and the decisions are X, Y, and Z. You're still going to get these eight things. I mean, it's, we can keep it short and simple. But it can't, I don't know. I mean, you were in the last meeting. Okay, yeah, I, wa I, want, I want to add to that right, right this way. All right, so here is what we've just heard. The dollar's down 25%. Now I'm going to take the people's side. Yeah, and my light bill is up 100%. So you want more money out of me to cover that, but I can't pay my light bill and pay my fuel bill. So to come in, to come in with this plane and belly land it on the table is is a disaster it's going to sink the no, whole that's thing. what i'm saying like it's there's no, all kinds of things I'm going agree, on. i'm agreeing with you but I, I liked your presentation and now i give the other side what the reality is so this is tenuous at best so well donna let me i really want to drive this point home because if they come in with the wrong presentation we can't change it once it's happened so it's so important that they pay attention to the nitty-gritty and they speak to the average citizen, not to uh, other architects. Yeah, not right. So I just want to make sure that, that that everybody's aware that we're not going back to the town to ask them for more money. That's a we're not doing that. So it's we're gonna we're gonna use the money that we have to build what we can, and I think that's what it is. So I don't want the people in, in the town to think that the school's gonna come back to them and say, well, we don't have enough money, so now we need to come to you and get more money. That's not what we're doing. All right, I wanna buy a Corvette, but you're telling me now I can't have a convertible. But I also, can, Diane, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I also wanna stress that they're trying to make the cuts in other places other than programming. They wanna make sure that we get better programming out of this. So it's more about making cuts um, with the, the building itself rather than cutting out a program or not doing a program. They want to make sure they get the programming in there is their um, goal. Okay. We'll hold that thought for that, that <laughs> meeting. Yes. I think. Yeah. Because I think that could open mm -hmm. a can of worms with not everybody here. Mm -hmm. that my it would be, um, maybe we need to put our minds to how we could fill that dollar gap as a board. Is there, an, is there another way? Uh, I'd like to say to the state of New Hampshire, okay, state of New Hampshire, we did everything that we were supposed to do. We went through the entire process. 80% of us voted for it, and we don't have the money to complete it now, and that's not our fault. You have access, the state, to millions of dollars when we talk in thousands of dollars. And for them to say no is to say that they're going to ditch the CTE center, which is, which 
from the DOE side, Department of Education side, that's their objective. They want us to do this. They enticed us. We said no once. Now they're enticing us to come forward. And we did it. We weren't responsible for what happened that caused the 25%. Maybe 5% we didn't plan on. But who would have planned for 25%? So can we go to the DOE and say, hey, save us. $3 million to them is not that much money. So then if we have that money, then we only need to make the change because of the location of and the daylight for the agriculture, etc. So that's back to the letter. Is that who it should go to? DOE? I think that we haven't been told no. And I, what I'm just concerned a little bit with is that I think that this is not that Please don't, please don't mistake and then I'm saying this, but we're pulling away from transparency right now because we're talking about a topic that is very hot for the public and it's not on our agenda. Agreed. And so I am just concerned that people are going to think that we're, we're doing this without them being notified and the people that are listening are going to maybe say something to somebody else and then somebody else may say, I wasn't told this was on the agenda, I would have been at the meeting. And so I'm just really nervous right now that we're, I would rather wait would till the wait. October, to the, um, October 13th meeting to have this discussion that way we can make sure that everybody knows about it and that we can have um, the same discussion but with the public having knowledge of it well said I agree. and I'm not trying to be disrespectful by any means and then the presentation would be after that by the by uh, of the dollars we can have so. we can yeah we can have them here and we can do a presentation on what the expect what it's going to be what we're looking at in other if words, it's we, all going to come at that one meeting Yes. If the state says no, remember, the state hasn't said no yet. So if the state says no, this is what the plan is going to be. And so I think that's what we need to be looking at. And so that's what they'll do. But I want to halt this discussion because mm -hmm. people don't even know, even know about the state letter yet. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think we are treading past the line. We have crossed the line of, of talking about this topic. And it's important that we talk about it, but I want to make sure. That's why Steve and I didn't put it on this agenda for this very reason so it needs to be saved for the October 13th right but we we can wander from the agenda we're, we're, we're on topic um, and uh, so not when you're talking I, about things that the public doesn't know well if if we let left here tonight with a decision that a letter went a strong letter went to DOE to influence whether we got that money or not and we got the money um, you'd have to apologize Okay. All we, options. We have to. We have no choice. The presentation and, and the asking, begging, threatening, whatever we have to do. Phil, did you have something? I was going to agree that um, we probably shouldn't take this conversation. I agree 100% that the public should be invited to this conversation. Um, I'm sure the committee administrative is looking at options. Um, and that those will be presented to both the board and the public at the appropriate time. Um, so yeah, no, I do agree with not going too far beyond the agenda on this subject. Okay. I'm right. gonna move on from committee report out. So. New hires. We have one or do we have two? Just the one. Just the one. Okay. Um, I will move. Lynn Kozad for school guidance, correct? Yes. Little school guidance, BA step one, 36467. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Uh, I didn't say aye, I didn't. Uh. Is that the one I got? Two days ago. Two or three days ago. Yep. Okay. Yep. I might. Yes. Here, yes. Steve, I'm sorry, I went too fast. Oh, I. Well. I'm. I. Yes. Yes. Okay. All 
All right. Welcome aboard, Caitlin. We're happy to have you. Okay. So resignations. Policies first read. Um, student member of the school board. This is now uh, a policy that we will start to look into. This is a first read. That's what. So what I did is every every time you see red, that means that it's something that, <laughs> which is the whole policy, that is that means it's a brand new policy. So any red is change. Okay. Um, I will move that we accept the first read of policy BB student member of the school board. This just means that we've all read through it once. If any one of you or any of the public have any questions or concerns about it, it does come back for a second read where changes can be made. But I will move that first read. <coughs> Is there a second? second up. Any discussion? I had one thing that I'd like to see. <laughs> um, it does say in under election of term of student school board members, uh, number three, a vacancy shall be filled by the principal. But then under responsibilities of student government, number three is filling any vacancy that may occur by the student, um, may occur in the student member position from that school. So that I'm not, I'm unclear then who fills that vacancy. And I know this is just from the yeah. New Hampshire School Board Association, but that um, was unclear to me when reading it. So, didn't know if there were any thoughts from the I can I can ask what that mean, what exactly that means. I'm fine if it's the principal and I'm fine if it's the student body. Um, but I don't think both of them should be in the policy unless it's written more clearly. <coughs> So are we looking to have a discussion on that? I mean, no, I, I just, I'm just bringing it up, but is there any other discussion on it? No, I mean, I agree with you that it okay. conflicts. Okay. And then currently, we're just going to go with number three, right? Because they're not going to vote because we only have one person. Right, right. So it would seem that the student government uh, position, maybe <coughs> it fills it after, you know, the principal nominates somebody and then, you know, within two months or a month of somebody right. departing, then student body elects a new member, something like that. Okay. Right? Just some language change in there. Something so it doesn't seem like both are responsible for it. Okay, so we'll look into that. But all those in favor of the first read? Uh, Aye. Aye. Uh, number, oh. uh, number one under general policy. Um, why is uh, student members the board will add one or more student members. Well, I think the ideal that Shannon and I were talking about earlier is one would be is okay, but two would be good because if that if the primary student member could not attend, that an alternate would attend. Okay, I'll pass on this one. Okay, is that a yes or just abstain? Abstain. Abstain. Okay. So that's four zero one. Thank you. All right. Um, this is a revised policy. So this would still be under a first read for our board. This is BCB uh, board member conflict. Um, something that was brought to my attention and that we, as the policy committee, uh, looked into at the school board association level. Um, go ahead. No, Did you? Okay. So, per the request of the board, I reached out to the New Hampshire School Board Association to ask members working in the school or coaching a sport. There's an RS 67118 disqualifying a board member from employment in salaried or hourly position. It's, they, he, they said that the School Board Association strongly recommends following the policy as written due to board members becoming subordinates to administrators, the way they would have to interact with parents, supervising of students or other staff members, such as assistant coaches. So they advise against it because they, again, they become a subordinate to um, administration and those other things. However, what they stated is in specific cases, such as sports, 
if the appointment out, is outweighed by the downside of making it, so there's no other available candidates, so say, for instance, baseball season, there's no other candidates and a school board member steps up, then if that's the case, then they would say that the board would just simply make the appointment rather than embedding it in a policy. The policy that is currently written, the one that we have, does not prohibit that arrangement from taking place. The red that you see in here was the changes that were made in the policy since this policy was, was reviewed last by it. So it has nothing to add in to this stuff. It was what was added in to the new policy um, when it was, it was what, 9 one no, I'm sorry. It was approved in 2020. So since 2020, these are the changes that have been made in this policy. So that's why I added them. I figured since we were opening up, we might as well make those changes as well. Okay, so if a board member wanted to be in a position that would put them in, in I think it was listed as like daily contact with students, parents, and under the being a subordinate of an administrator. Right. That appointment is made by the board. Right, right. right. Okay. I think all appointments are made by the board so that you'd have to, you bring them forward. Um, well, in Not those cases, like coaching, though. right, but if it's a conflict, right, right, all right, uh, I will move this first read of BCB board member conflict of interest, is there a second, second. discussion, Was this fixed what I was about or yep, okay, that's the only question I have, that's all I needed to know, <laughs> does this fix it, yep, yep, All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? I, I abstain. Abstain. Okay. Thank you very much. Communication. That's nothing. That's just that. That's my presentation in color. Okay. That you have right oh, but now, actually, no, that's not. All right. So the the thing that you have here, everyone should have this. Bird. Do you have one? You should have one in the packet. This is the survey results from the survey that, that I took. So as you can <coughs> see, as you, as you go through it, Bert, did you not, you should have one in your packet. Yeah, I can. Well, I don't think, I told her just to get the board. The board. All right. That's Maybe right. I get go yours ahead. on accident, Bert. I think I got yours on accident. All right, so this, this is the survey that went out for ESSER, the ESSER 3 that I was talking about earlier. And so if you look at it, so one of the first questions was, what is your role? And so if you look at it, we had um, 55 community members actually answer the survey, which was great. We had 141 family members. So, you know, I was actually very impressed with how many, how many people we had. We had 247 responses to this survey, which is great. You know, um, I haven't seen a survey with this many people responding to it in a long time. And so out of this, we had 17 students and 73 staff members respond to it. And so then, I, then the next question is, you know, where do, they, where do they work? And so it just gave an area of where they worked and if it didn't apply. As you can see, 67% of the population did not work for the district. So that was well. And then when you look at where the child attends, 28.3% of them do not even have children that go to our district. So I thought that was great in itself. So we're having a lot of community members that are, um, don't really have a vested interest in the, the schools because they have students that go here or children that go here, but they still took the time to fill out the survey and to answer the questions that we had. Does this take into account families with kids in multiple schools? Yeah, yeah, it does. And then the next page was um, asking them to pick three strategies that they felt would be um, what we should really focus on. And if you look, the very at 78% enrichment opportunities. So they would like to see the children involved in more um, type of enrichment opportunities. Um, and then tied would be expanded instruction resources and then before and after school tutoring. And so I thought that was great. The tutoring I thought was great. And then we, we want to look at if we're going to be doing before and after school tutoring, transportation, right? Because we want to make sure that if we're providing tutoring, we want to have a late bus so the kids can get home. Uh, then, num then the next one um, coming in, I should say number four, but number three was special education services. 68% of the, the people that um, answered this poll said they'd like special education services. Can and I, then tie. You, you yeah. keep saying percent, but that's just the total number. It's a typo. Like number one should be 30, 
one percent, right? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So it should be thirty-one point six percent, right? Is the enrichment opportunities? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's seventy-eight people. I'm sorry about that. Awesome. Just for clarity's I'll sake. I'll just take that down. Yeah. <coughs> and then um, tied at the end for behavior inter were behavior intervention and professional development opportunities for 66, 66 of our, their people, which would, would be 26.7%. And then the last page, what I did is I, it was a question that just said, um, is there any additional input that you have that will um, allow us effective use to help support our student learning? And so what I did is I took a lot of, there were a lot of common themes, and these were the common themes among all of the, all of the um, examples. So we had 247 responses, and so this, those are a few of the examples. But like I said to you, there were multiple of the same. Maybe not the exact verbiage, but it fell into that criteria. So if I was to set criteria and then put all of these into buckets, this is what they would fall into. And I, I think there's some overlap here. Yeah, there is some. Especially around staff, supporting staff. How would you define an enrichment opportunity? I would uh, find, I would. Was it defined it. on the survey or did you just say enrichment opportunities? Enrichment opportunities. And I think that enrichment would be <coughs> something that goes above and beyond what they normally do in the classroom. So you have your, you know, your tier approach, is what you're learning in the classroom. And so, um, parents and whoever in the survey is saying, we'd like something more, right? So if our kid needs more, we want them to be able to get more as well as any other type of activities that we can do with our students to support their learning. So it doesn't, it could be before and after school activities that Build they do, trips. like we do 4-H or something like that. Mm -hmm. This just is a broad term. On, yeah. yeah. If this document's going to be passed out, the percentages need to be changed also. In the yeah, I'll change text. that and make sure, yeah. But that is just, a, I just wanted to give you a, a brief overview on the survey. This is the survey's results from the surveys that go out that have to do with um, ESSER. Okay. Thank you. I just need to change that. No worries. Um, any other communication from the administration? Do you have anything you want to add? Okay. You good? Okay. okay. How about you? Are you good? I am good. Again, I just want to give a, a shout out to our staff. They're really working hard and and educating our students and I'm very every day I'm more and more impressed with the things that our staff are doing to just go above and beyond um, you know I, it, they're really stepping up and it's very very nice to see it's great to be part of such a, uh, an amazing team very good. anything from the board yep. uh, a couple things um, I saw on Facebook for the, the light up the lights for the football field that Kelly Simpson was doing that Heartless Blueberry Farm. They have a, a sin bin, they call it. So if you pick blueberries and you know, you're eating them, technically you're not paying for them kind of thing. So they said it's a donation thing where people put money in. And I guess this year they had the best outcome out of that ever. So they donated that money, which is $3,835 to the lights program. So uh, um, definitely a shout out for that because that's that's huge in there. You know, it's just small Who farm. Is that? That's Bartlett's blueberry farm. Thank you. Today. And then uh, Saturday at the football game, they're doing tackle hunger, which I guess is a statewide thing. But so for for us here, two o'clock. If you have a canned item, or whatever you want to bring to the football game, that would be awesome. And there's the shout out to Shannon. Uh, field hockey team is seven and one. Her first year coaching Newport. Anybody else? So I just want to add a shout out to uh, our facilities team. The snack shack looks absolutely amazing. I, um, I stopped while they were still working on it. I actually got to know some of the new guys that I haven't met before, you know, um, an incredibly talented team. And, uh, you know, it just looks good even driving by. You know, you could just tell that it's, you know, they put pride into it. And uh, you know, they definitely deserve the kudos. One man deserves a lot of credit, and uh, his name is Rick. 
Thomas Bach. He's the one that really put a lot of work in into doing that. He's the one that really put a lot of work into doing that. And I felt, you know, what's great is that he spent, I think it was like 30 years as a builder. And he went into retirement because he was done building. And then here we have him out there building, the poor guy. But it's great. And if you happen to walk down the hallway, he's actually working here tonight. So. And he did, he also did the library did in Richards, right? And the, in the walkway that goes into the preschool oh, room. Yeah, it's beautiful. How about these tables? Did he do the tables? He made, yeah, he made the tables and then somebody else stained them. But yeah, he did. He, so and yeah, very talented. We have very talented, very talented people. I hope we're not taking advantage. And there's, uh, there was a, a tipping point. Either you go right or left. <laughs> and uh, he pulled the rabbit out of the hat. So. Steve, do you have anything? Okay. I don't, I don't have anything um, in particular. Uh, Thank you, as always, to our teachers and our staff. Thank you to our families. Um, I'm hopeful that we, as board members, can continue to be a presence in the schools and visit. Um, I know Bill and I had an opportunity um, to do the preschool tour at Richards. Um, I'd like to, if I can, get into the <coughs> high school. I know Tim, you do a lot of stuff there as well. So um, I'm really proud of, of Newport. Always have been and I still am. So thank you. And with that, we have a non-public under 91-A, colon 3, Roman, number, Roman numeral 2A, which is the dismissal, promotion, or compensation of any public employee, or the disciplining of such employee, or the investigation of any charges against him or her, unless the employee affected has the right to a public meeting, and request that the meeting be open, in which case the request shall be granted. So I move that we enter into non-public. Is there a second? Second. And I need a roll call vote. Tim? Tim Beard, aye. Bill? Bill Wilkins, aye. Bert? Bert Spalding, senior, aye. Steve? Steve Morris, aye. And Jenna Darling, aye. Thank you very much. Uh, Diana Carey, please go home. Thank you. Thank you. I love with my birth name there.